Everybody in your crew identifies as either Big Mac Burger, McNuggets, or McCrispy Sandwich. But you're the filet fish Sandwich all day. That crispy fish, that savory tartar sauce, that melty cheese, that pillowy bun. Yeah, you get it. Every time. And if you love the filet of fish right now you can catch two of the classics you love for just $6. Limited time only. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. The French Revolution set Europe ablaze. It was an age of enlightenment and progress, but also of tyranny and oppression. It was an age of glory and an age of tragedy. One man stood above it all. This was the age of Napoleon. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast. Join me as I examine the life and times of one of the most fascinating and enigmatic characters in modern history. Look for the Age of Napoleon wherever you find your podcasts. Hi, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please help us get the word out. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and rate the series on iTunes. Thanks again for listening. A newborn can be a symbol of hope, but given recent events, it's hard to imagine how much hope Cleopatra Thea could muster. In a way, the infant Seleucus was just a bitter reminder that she had another son named Antiochus, concealed somewhere in the Syrian desert, who, if ever found, would likely be put to death. Her mood probably wasn't improved too much by the fact that her current home, once glorious Antioch, had recently been a smoldering ruin choked with tens of thousands of rotting corpses. Not the bodies of foreign invaders, but of her own rebellious citizens. In 144 BC, Cleopatra Thea was still only 20 years old. As wife of the 14-year-old Demetrius II, survivor of the Battle of the Anoparos River, she was still, at the very least, the unchallenged queen of Syria. Though, going by the past few years, you were almost reflexively compelled to add, for the moment. At the moment, the couple's main priority was restoring some kind of normalcy to Antioch, and radiating from there to the rest of the kingdom. But it was proving to be an extremely daunting task. Refugees who'd fled the mass slaughter found shelter in surrounding cities, bringing tales of the despotic boy king and his brutal army of Judeans and mercenaries. It was, to put it mildly, not a fantastic promotional campaign for her husband's new regime. The first glimmers of something ominous arose in the city of Chalcis when a Seleucid general named Diodotus rose up in revolt. Demetrius II responded to the threat by ordering that Diodotus be arrested. Returning from the failed attempt, his troops reported they'd found the rebellion a bit more rambunctious than expected. Shortly afterward came the news that must have turned Thea's blood to ice. The rebel Diodotus had Thea's son and it just had him very publicly elevated as King Antiochus VI. As you may recall, the child in question was Thea's four-year-old son from her previous marriage to Alexander Ballas, who'd been placed in the care of an Emocene sheik named Iamblichus. Thea hadn't seen her son for over three years, since shortly after his birth. But for enemies of the new regime, he was a potent political symbol. All things considered, the odds that both of Thea's children would survive what was coming were vanishingly slim. Historian John D. Granger uses fragmentary sources and the minting of coins to sketch the rebellion's progress. Diodotus was initially based in Chalcis, but it also gained control of a Seleucid cavalry unit based in Larissa, and was soon in control of the major city of Apamea. 
Diodotus was also backed by the tribal forces of the Emocene Sheikh Iamblichus. Though details are lacking, during its first year, the rebellion grew sufficiently large to threaten the capital of Antioch. And it was likely a combination of factors that led to what came next. Demetrius, for pretty obvious reasons, was horribly unpopular in Antioch, and its recent damage and general layout made the city tough to defend. Sometime in 143, Demetrius and Thea fled the capital for the coastal stronghold of Seleucia Pieria. When they did, they took along their two young children. Wait, two children? That's right. Thea's one-year-old son, Seleucus, already had a newborn brother named Antiochus. And, in fairness, going into exile in their very first year was pretty good Seleucid boot camp. On their departure from Antioch, the rebel Diodotus, and Thea's eldest son, the now five-year-old King Antiochus VI, quickly invested the city giving their rebellion an extra dose of legitimacy. Soon enough, major cities in Cilicia and Palestine were also backing the rebellion. There were even signs that Babylonia was moving to support Diodotus. Granger notes that in the east, Camnascaris and Elemius recovered control of Susa from an army of Antiochus, son of Alexander which suggests that Seleucid forces in Babylon had either joined Antiochus VI or, perhaps more likely, had become divided in their allegiance. Either way, the upshot was that Camnascaris of Elemius was still a significant threat. So, what were Demetrius and Thea's assets? Well, apart from their control of Seleucia Pieria, they had the allegiance of the Phoenician cities of Byblos, Beritus, Sidon, and Tyre. Though Alexander Ballas's old stronghold of Ptolemaeus Acho supported his son, Antiochus VI. Thea and Demetrius also retained control of Laodicea. So, roughly speaking, they held important cities along the northern coast, and that was about it. And you may not be too surprised to hear that the end result was, you guessed it, another stalemate. Which, as you also may have guessed, meant that it was time for the Judeans to weigh in. Though they'd briefly supported Demetrius II in putting down the rebellion in Antioch, the Judeans had always been tighter with Alexander Ballas which meant their current high priest, Jonathan Maccabee, was sympathetic to Antiochus VI. Josephus reports that the child Antiochus sent ambassadors and a letter to Jonathan, and made him his friend and confederate. Antiochus, meaning Diodotus, also appointed Jonathan's brother Simon to be general over the forces from the ladder of Tyre unto Egypt essentially making him military commander of the territories of southern Palestine. Simon decided to exercise his new authority by marching on several local cities to persuade them to break with Demetrius. Ashkelon rolled over pretty quickly, as did Gaza, after a brief siege and some burning and despoiling of the local countryside. But the biggest challenge was the city of Beth Zur, which held a Seleucid garrison. Learning that Simon had surrounded the city, Demetrius dispatched an army south to try to relieve his troops. In the context of the civil war, it's unclear how many soldiers Demetrius could send. Probably not that many. Either way, Judean forces under Jonathan Maccabee took up a strong position near the Sea of Galilee. Demetrius's army was unable to dislodge them and was forced to retire back to Syria. Meanwhile, Simon Maccabee compelled the surrender of Bethzur and Joppa on the coast. 
it was a pretty clear sign that Demetrius was limited in what he could accomplish down south. In the summer of 142, Thea received more gut-wrenching news. Her six-year-old son, the rebel king Antiochus VI, was dead. The cause appeared to be a surgery gone wrong, which is just sad and tragic. And really, what an odd life, even for a Seleucid prince. Handed off as a newborn to be raised by a desert tribe, then plucked back up and made a king and used as a weapon against your own mother, only to die on a surgeon's table, and all by the age of six. More proof that the fates can be creative as well as cruel. Demetrius, of course, was likely delighted, though he may have been tactful with the fist pumps and high fives. Because as hard as the news was for his wife to bear, it was very much worse for Diodotus. The rebel general hitched his fortunes to the young Antiochus VI, and now that his charge had suddenly died, his cause could easily collapse. In his capital of Antioch, Diodotus took the only logical step. He grabbed a conference room, ordered some Chinese food, and held a brainstorming session. It wasn't long before someone suggested that the simplest answer to the general's problems might be a little rebranding. Let's start with your name, Diodotus. Seriously, I just fell asleep halfway through saying that. What we need is something that pops, like Elvis or Prince or... How about Trifon? It means magnificent. Yeah, let's go with Trifon. Now, it may have been a group decision, but it's also possible that Diodotus returned from a bathroom break, threw a bunch of confetti and glitter in the air, and said, Hey everyone, I'm Trifon. Which is a visual I really enjoy, so I'm tempted to go with that. The next item on the agenda was picking a slogan. After more discussion, they finally settled on Make Syria Macedonian Again. And I'm not even remotely making that up. As Granger notes, Trifon launched a new propaganda scheme in which he put on his coins a picture of the Macedonian shield to emphasize the Macedonian origin of the state and to appeal to the Macedonian-descended element of the population. The purpose of this was to imply the revitalization of the kingdom in the face of recent Seleucid decadence. They also decided that the Seleucid calendar, previously dated to 312 BC, would now be reset to year one. Which as any student of revolutions can tell you, always works out totally great. And, last but not least, Trifon would personally claim the kingship, to lead the people in his glorious new age of Trifonness. I'm guessing the announcement was met with a smattering of applause and a sea of tight-lipped smiles. Whatever the reason, King Diodotus Trifon did gain some early traction. Over the next few months, Thea and Demetrius got the news that two Phoenician cities, Byblos and Beritus, had fallen to the rebels. Beritus was essentially destroyed, and would pretty much remain that way until later rebuilt as a Roman veterans colony. This left only two Phoenician cities— Sidon and Tyre, still in Demetrius's camp. Both were situated along the coast between the rebel-held cities of Byblos and Ptolemaeus Acho. Trifon soon dispatched an army to take these remaining cities. Legitimist forces under a general named Sarpedon marched out to confront them, but the loyalists were quickly routed and fled along the coast. Then, and this is one of those historical nuggets you couldn't make up if you tried, as Trifon's soldiers pursued them south, 
A huge tidal wave rolled in and swept Trifon's entire army out to sea. And whether you take it as a sign from the gods or otherwise, that was about it for Trifon's momentum. It's also worth noting that Trifon's slogan of Make Syria Macedonian Again didn't particularly resonate with his Jewish allies, for pretty obvious reasons. Not to mention that the Judeans had originally come on board due to residual loyalty to Alexander Ballas, and now that his son Antiochus was dead, their support was a bit more conditional. Tryphon agreed to meet with Jonathan in Ptolemaeus Acho to try to hash things out, but it didn't go very well. The citizens of Ptolemaeus, never particular fans of the Judeans, spontaneously kidnapped Jonathan and handed him over to Tryphon for punishment. Tryphon tried to make lemonade and proceeded to parade Jonathan around Judea to demonstrate his control over the region. But when he tried to extort Jonathan's brother Simon to pay a huge sum for his release, Simon flat out refused. In order to save face, Tryphon was forced to kill Jonathan, then decided the smartest move was to get himself back up north. In the wake of his departure, the new Judean leader, Simon Maccabee, offered his support to Demetrius. So, anyone want to guess what happened next? We've had a rebellion and an extended stalemate, so next on the agenda is, yep, a foreign invasion. Because this was around when Mithridates brought his forces through the Behestun Pass and conquered Mesopotamia. And though Thea and Demetrius were likely gobsmacked, they couldn't have been too surprised. The Seleucids had yet to confront the Parthians, and their paralysis had emboldened their enemies. Just like when the Parthians had taken Media, the status quo was no longer viable, and Thea and Demetrius had to consider more radical solutions. And it's here at the age of 17, that Demetrius II begins to show some pretty remarkable qualities. Because the overall nature of the plan he develops is light years beyond his predecessors. Step one was, broadly, a repeat of the strategy embraced by Alexander Ballas. When Mithridates had taken media, Alexander had enlisted foreign support in that case from his father-in-law, King Ptolemy VI of Egypt. But the new Egyptian pharaoh, the 41-year-old Ptolemy Physcon, had shown no interest in Syrian affairs. In fact, the only recent news from Egypt was that Physcon, previously married to his sister Cleopatra II, had divorced her and married his niece. Thea's younger sister, the 16-year-old Cleopatra III. The upshot being that, whether or not they gave it a try, Thea and Demetrius were not getting help from Egypt. But Demetrius was wise enough, again at 17, to realize he couldn't go it alone. So his thoughts next turned to the other powers who might feel threatened by the Parthians. The first were the Bactrians, with whom the Seleucids hadn't really engaged for decades, but who, at some level, were still Macedonian and might have residual loyalties. With all the turbulence in Bactrian politics, and the Parthian Empire lying between them, it's unclear whether Demetrius even knew the name of the current Bactrian king. I'd be pretty surprised if he did. Either way, the Bactrians were critical, since they had the distinction, from Demetrius' perspective, of lying to the Parthian rear. Also on the list were Hispaeosines, the satrap of Cherusina on the Persian Gulf, and Vodfredad, the Frateraca, or Keeper of the Fire, of the Seleucid province of Persis. But the hardest pill to swallow 
and the one reflecting Demetrius's maturity, desperation, or both, was the inclusion of his bitter enemy, Camnascaris II of Elemius. The Elemians had been responsible, directly or indirectly, for the deaths of two Seleucid kings, and had just retaken Susa from Seleucid forces. In the case of Camnascaris, the only hope was that he feared the Parthians more than he hated the Seleucids. So, Demetrius had a list of prospective allies. Now all he needed was a plan. And I don't just mean a war plan for fighting the Parthians. I mean a comprehensive plan for the survival of his dynasty and their ongoing control of Syria. And this part took not only maturity, but a healthy dose of self-reflection. Because Demetrius had to accept that he was despised. His brutal suppression of the Antioch riots had poisoned his rule from the get-go. To what extent the hatred was justified, or whether anyone else in his shoes could have done any better, was basically academic. It was a fact, but also, ironically, one that Demetrius could use to his advantage. If Demetrius took the army east, not only would it let him confront Mithridates, but Equally important, it would get him away from Syria. Without a convenient devil to point to, Tryphon's support might wither away, since, let's be honest, despite the fun name, he had zero royal legitimacy. But at the same time, leaving Syria was a very high-stakes gamble. Thea would stay and rule in his absence, and also care for their two young sons. But if Tryphon captured Seleucia Pieria, he could pretty much sweep the board. What Demetrius needed was a combination ace in the hole, silver bullet, and panic button. Something to keep his kingdom secure while he waged war on the Parthians. And while he didn't have that, he did have a younger brother. Demetrius' 16-year-old brother, Antiochus, was living the good life in coastal Anatolia. In fact, he'd lived in Sidae for so long that everyone called him Sidetes. Nobody knows how often they communicated, but the brothers definitely kept in touch, and there's no hint of any drama or friction. Up until now, Antiochus had stayed away from Syria to try to protect the family line. But if Demetrius was heading off east, he needed his brother on standby. There were any number of grim scenarios that might necessitate calling him in. But the if, when, and why of all that would be left to Cleopatra Thea. So it was decided. Demetrius would dispatch emissaries to seek the support of regional allies, make preparations to march against the Parthians, and start the conversation with his brother Antiochus about possibly coming to Syria. Not a bad plan for a 17-year-old king widely despised as a vicious, brutal tyrant. While the agents fanned out to deliver their messages, Demetrius somehow managed to assemble and ready a Seleucid army without tipping his hand to Tryphon. Incredibly, the stalemate held and secrecy was maintained through the end of 141, when Demetrius marched his army out of Seleucia Pieria, across the Euphrates, and into Mesopotamia. His initial destination was Nisibis, or at least that was the city's conventional name. When the Aramaeans had founded it centuries earlier, it was called Nasibina, and it was also known as Nisibis to the later Romans. But when Antiochus III had marched against Molon, he'd renamed the city Antioch in Mygdonia, which is likely what it was called in 141. Either way, Demetrius quickly invested the city, and soon the mint was cranking out coins to pay the Seleucid army. 
When Demetrius arrived, Mithridates was in neighboring media, either confronting a Bactrian assault or a possible nomadic invasion. And either in coordination with Demetrius's plan or just taking advantage of the Parthian absence, Camnascaris of Elimius launched an invasion of Babylonia. The Babylonian diarist, quoted by Granger, records an attack on the city of Apamea on the Silhu, which was apparently sacked and burned. Camnascaris quickly faced two main problems. The first was that Demetrius' arrival guaranteed Mithridates' imminent return. So the Elemians had limited time to conquer and consolidate control. The second problem was at least as large and infinitely more ancient. You see, the Elemians traced their descent from the Elamites. And the Elamites and Babylonians had been fighting each other for, oh, 2,500 years or so which is another way of saying that nothing united the people of Babylonia like an Elamite invasion. Mithridates' viceroy in Babylonia, a man named Antiochus, son of King Arabuzana, was able to rally the Babylonians to successfully challenge the Elemians. The Babylonian diarist, quoted by Granger, describes the conflict shifting north toward Babylon and mentions fighting in the city, the flight of refugees, and damage to both the city walls and the famous Marduk Gate. If this was all part of Demetrius's plan, he took absolutely zero advantage, which makes it likely that Camnascaris had acted on his own, or at the very least, acted way too soon. Demetrius likely wasn't ready to move south, or worried that If he did, Mithridates and the Parthian army might swoop right down on his rear. Whatever his reasons, Demetrius stayed put in Nisibis, which meant the resolution of the southern conflict was left to Mithridates. In the spring of 140 BC, while his viceroy fought Camnascaris in Babylon, Mithridates and the Parthian army invaded Elemius from the north. It's reasonably likely that, on hearing the news, Camnascaris came back to confront him. If so, things didn't turn out very well. Granger notes that the coinage of Camnascaris ceases during 140, implying that he had ceased to rule and probably he was killed. Granger also notes that the Persians, the weakest of the Allies, likely capitulated at about this same time. So, despite all the plans and preparations, things quickly came down to the two main players, Demetrius II and Mithridates I. And around mid-140, it was Demetrius' turn to take the initiative moving his forces south along the Tigris to confront the Parthian army. Mithridates moved north to meet him, and, fittingly enough, the arena of their initial conflict was likely Seleucia on the Tigris. (laughs) ¶¶ 